Thank you. Thank you, Brave New Films, Robert Greenwald, for creating this extraordinary film. In a certain way, the film shows us that some very important things are changing. We are in an extraordinary national, indeed an international conversation about the American criminal system, about structural racism, about police violence against black people and against black men in particular, and about how the misdemeanor system is making all of this worse. There is far more information, far more data today than there was back when I wrote Punishment Without Crime. There's greater attention to these terribly important questions. And these, these are reasons for optimism. And yet, uh, and yet at the same time, much has not changed. We are still the biggest, harshest, and most racially discriminatory criminal system on the planet. The United States locks up more people in prison and jail than any other country. As we speak, police officer Derek Chauvin is being tried for the murder of George Floyd. But even when he is convicted, even when Chauvin is convicted, justice will still not have been done because we will not have solved the problem. We will not have solved the problem of misdemeanor overcriminalization, and the problem of police violence against black men that the misdemeanor system exacerbates. I hope that this film, this book, this conversation will help us all figure out how to make the changes that we need to make, to make them real, to make our criminal system more just. In other words, to transform it into the kind of public institution that every person deserves to be served by well. Before I introduce our extraordinary panelists who are gonna help us think through some of these questions, I would like to thank and acknowledge the experts who you just saw, whose interviews and work helped make this film so powerful and rich and deep, uh, but who ha happen not to be here with us physically today. Douglas Blackman, author of the Pulitzer Prize winning book, Slavery by Another Name. Professor Paul, Bu Paul Butler, author of Chokehold, Professor Georgetown Law. Professor Khalil Gibran Muhammad, author of The Condemnation of Blackness, professor here at the Harvard Kennedy School. Professor Irene Joe, prof uh, professor at um, the UC Davis School of Law, an expert on race and public defense, among many other things. And Professor Gay Teresa Johnson, who's a professor of race, culture, and history at UCLA. Okay, so the panelists who have been so generous with their uh, uh, with their time to be with us today, we I, I'm going to introduce them. I'm going to give them each a few minutes to share with us their insights, their thoughts, the way uh, they understand this film and the misdemeanor issue in relationship to their work and their experiences. We'll give them a chance to talk. And then at the, um, at the end of that conversation, we'll also take some questions uh, from the press who I, know, uh, who I know are watching. So first, of course, Robert Greenwald, founder of Brave New Films, director of this film, Racially Charged. Mr. Greenwald is an award-winning producer. He's the director of more than 60, 60 features, television movies, miniseries. His work has garnered awards from organizations including the ACLU, Physicians for Social Responsibility, the Robert Wood Johnson Award, a Peacemaker Award from the Los Angeles chapter of the National Lawyers Guild, too many other awards and recognitions for me to list here. Mr. Chris Lolly, who in a way we have all now met from the film. Uh, he is a musician, he's from Chicago, he's a father of four. Rachel Rollins uh, is the district attorney for Suffolk County here in Boston. She's the first woman of color to hold that position. DA Rollins has been a trailblazer in this arena of misdemeanor policy reform. When she first ran for office here, she ran on a platform of misdemeanor declination. That is, she promised to refrain from prosecuting a list of 15 low-level misdemeanors, uh, a decision for which she has taken an enormous amount of heat. Since then, progressive prosecutors around the country have been imitating and following her lead. Udi Ofer is the Deputy National Political Director of the ACLU. He's the director of the ACLU's Justice Division, which leads their advocacy on criminal justice reform, policing, drug law reform, and ending the death penalty. 
Uh, he has been a leader advocating and organizing around bail reform, criminal decriminalization, stop and frisk, many other areas of misdemeanor change and reform. And Dr. Sandra Susan Smith is the Daniel and Florence Guggenheim Professor of Criminal Justice. She is the faculty director of the Program in Criminal Justice Policy Management at the Harvard Kennedy School. Uh, she is also the Carol Fortzheimer Professor at the Radcliffe Institute. She's an expert scholar in urban poverty, uh, joblessness, social capital, social networks, pretrial detention, and diversion. I want now to, to turn, um, turn to our panelists. Uh, Robert Greenwald, please, um, please start us off. Thank you, and thank you again, Alexandra, for the book and for arranging today's event. I want to first uh, thank the really amazing staff and group of people, women and men at Brave New Films, who've worked on this from research to filming, to editing, to distributing, to press, to working with the groups around the country, the various D DAs, and who are making this event happen today. It's been um, quite a challenge, and the folks have put the years and the time and the effort into making this, so thanks to every single one of you. Um, at Brave New Films, you know, we're a small nonprofit. <clears throat> we work on a series of different issues, different films from voter suppression to inequality to wars. They're all available uh, for free as this one is, but it relies on every one of you who's watching the film to make use of it. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit at the very end, but bear in mind that this is a tool so that everybody can do something in terms of educating, helping, inspiring. <clears throat> the films we do, well, they have varied themes. The common denominator, I would say, is that what we try to do is put a face on policy and connect the dots, which makes it a face that helps us understand the systemic issues that Alexandra and many of the professors in the film have talked about so wisely and so eloquently. We need to turn that into a human dimension. So putting the face on policy, the maybe the most key part of our work, how, what is that about? Well, first and foremost, it's finding the faces. So researching, finding the stories from the past. And then more important, finding the people like Chris, who will speak to us a little bit later today, who've experienced it, who are willing to talk, who are willing to come forth, who are willing to call out the system, the racism and the exploitation and the issues involved. And putting Chris and the others, connecting them to the stories of the past allows us to help begin to put the face on policy. How else did we do it? Well, in the midst of filming or early into the process, COVID hit. And so we knew it was critically important to tell the story of how people's lives, not figuratively now, literally, their lives were at stake, right? A traffic ticket could get you incarcerated. COVID was widespread. There were virtually no protections. And now you're in danger of a death sentence because of a traffic ticket or because of spitting or because of jaywalking. That is, if you were black or brown, you were, it was not the same for whites and middle class. The other thing that happened in the midst of the working on the film was the misdemeanor murders. So these had obviously been going on for a while, but you know, when you work on something, you see the world through that lens. And we started to see so much through the lens of misdemeanors. And we realized, and some of you may know this, we didn't, but we realized during filming, just think about a few of these cases, Rodney King, Michael Brown, Eric Gardner, Freddie Gray, Philando Castile, Alton Sterling, Pamela Turner, Elijah McCain, George Floyd, and more that we don't know about. They were originally stopped, encountered, by the police for misdemeanors, which became murders. So it was so clear we must change the film and incorporate that into the story. 
These were faces, deaths, that helped us understand yet another aspect and another dimension of what misdemeanors were doing. And then the systemic part of it, how do you make a film that deals with systemic issues and helps people feel something? I like to talk about what we do is first you reach the heart and then you reach the mind. Um, at least our work is. There are people here who are expert at papers and lawsuits and research and doing all kinds of work. Our job is to get the heart going, to have people feel something intensely, powerfully, and then to take that emotion and move it towards action, action being the most important part of it. So mass, there's mass participation in the criminal system. We follow the money as a part of how that system came about and how so many people profit from it. We connect it to the racialization of crime to racial capitalism, to racist myths that have served the purpose of suppressing and oppressing, and trying to do that all in the context of a film with human beings at the center. So that at the end of the day, every one of you is motivated to take some action, to do something, to help change, fight what Alexandra has pointed out, what District Attorney Rollins is working on, what the ACLU is working on, so that we can look back and say we were part of changing this. So thanks each and every one of you and all of you watching. Hopefully you will be able to take action in your world and your community. Robert, thank you so much. Um, Mr. Lally, I'd like to turn to you and ask you, is there anything that didn't make it into the film <laughs> that you can share with us? That what do, you, what do you tell people now? How do you teach people now, given the experience that you have had with the misdemeanor system and working on this film and now um, coming out into the world with this, with this expertise? Well, I mean, first I wanna thank y'all for having me because it's, it's definitely, um, it's needed and I really appreciate y'all most definitely. It's a really good film, um, but what I try to tell people is, I mean, it's a, it's a big game, right? So, you know, there's the macro to the micro, you know, like there's so many small things going on <clears throat> and they use the smaller things to try and amp up bigger charges on you, you know, how that goes. So what I try to tell people, I mean, it's, there's a lot of laws out here that actually they help if you know them but these aren't the laws that, you know, are taught to people that look like me. You get what I'm saying? So, and my lawyer actually taught me a lot about um, certain things, you know, that I didn't even know I had the right to do or say, or, you know, so, but I really do think that it's, uh, it's more of an, an idea as opposed to like the laws and how they work because all these police are just really people, right? So I had to really realize that. And especially having a, a Caucasian lawyer, I don't think people, really realized that, um, you know, there was a little flack I got for that, uh, you know, the community and things like that. But I didn't want it to be necessarily about race as a whole, because I don't believe it's race. I actually believe it's it's an idea, right? It's the, just the idea that we're less than. And it's a, it's a, it's a virus, you know, so a lot of these police don't even live in the communities that they police in. They don't really understand how the community works. And a lot of places are different, but definitely in Minnesota, it's, uh, it's, it's really run rampant as far as where the, where the, po how the police police. And um, essentially if we like, like Robert said, you know, if we could touch the hearts and then change the mind, I think the idea of criminality will definitely just change because, I mean, policing isn't an easy job, but if you know the community that you're working in, then it becomes a little less of a hassle when dealing with people that you know and see on a day-to-day -day basis and you know how they operate and how they react to certain situations and scenarios, you know, so. But as far as 
you know, how moving forward, the future. I mean, I like how the video, the, the documentary definitely shows how even though we live 2021 and even though we live in this millennia now, nothing's really changed. Um, I think we just put band-aids over things and they rip off so easily. Um, so just making sure that the, the conversation is always apparent, making sure the conversation is always being had is definitely something we need to do. And this film does a great job at uh, showing the history and the future, you know, or, or the present of where we're at right now. And hopefully the future can be a big change. Really, that's definitely what we need, so. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for that. DA Rollins, I'd like to turn to you now. Um, as I said, you've been a trailblazer in this space ever since you took office. Uh, I, I just want to turn it over to you. Tell us what you think of the film, of the issue, how, how this is going to help us go forward. Uh, well, the film is just incredibly powerful. So Robert, you know, I was moved and it is just heart-wrenching. I go between like profound sorrow and rage, quite frankly, when I watch things like this. And I am also reminded of a speech I gave right after George Floyd was murdered. Uh, and we witnessed that, or others might call that a lynching as well. Um, and with the mayor, and I just said, I'm exhausted. And our community is tired of being murdered by the government that we pay our, ta our taxes pay for, um, and then told to please relax and keep it down when it comes to our first amendment right to protest. And we are the only people you know, I like to say black people are the most culturally appropriated people on the planet earth and we are blamed for our murders and it is, it is just exhausting. Um, but I think, you know, I loved hearing you, Robert, say you put a face on policy because what I try to do, sir, even with our pleadings and our legal documents that we file is what is the story we are telling, right? And I push back on my team and remember, it's a really odd relationship as an elected district attorney with my office because I am an outsider. You know, I was a federal prosecutor by trade, not a county prosecutor. I was a criminal defense attorney at some point in my life. I am, um, you know, the sibling of people who have touched the criminal legal system many times. I have, uh, I'm the guardian of two of my nieces based on many of these underlying, I like to call them comorbidity factors now as to what gets people into contact with the criminal legal system, substance use disorder, mental health, food and housing insecurity, um, and other circumstances that are far beyond their control, right? We penalize people for being poor um, every single day. So what I tried to do as a candidate was just you know, I did not want to trick anyone into voting for me. I wanted people to eyes wide open, say that's who I want or hell's no, right? Like that is not who I want, right? But what I wanted everyone was to say, okay, she's telling us that she's gonna, with her limited resources, not put all of her attention on these low level, nonviolent, non-serious crimes. She is going to focus our limited resources on the part one crimes, the rapes, the homicides, the armed assault with intent to murders that are plaguing those same neighborhoods where the police are just routinely stopping people for things that, as, as Paul Butler eloquently said, don't help keep us safe, right? Um, so that is the premise that I ran on. I'm very proud that after putting it, saying it verbally and then putting it in writing, we won our primary and then the general and we have a mandate. So we won with over 80% of the vote. So whenever anyone questions what I'm doing, I'm like, why are you mad at me for being exactly who I told you I would be? And then what we have to do now, guys, and then I'll push it over to everyone else, is we're collecting data to make sure that we are adapting, right? Those list of 15 types of crimes, what, what, are, what does the data show? regarding do we have significant spikes in those crimes now? And, and I use the word crimes loosely, but those violations now, um, 
you know, or not. And, and I make sure I speak with the very people are, that are the most maddest um, at what I'm proposing, because I also think it's really important that we not hide, um, that I don't become a different person depending on who I'm speaking with um, or what I'm trying to get out of that room. So I think this film will be something that I will be speaking quite a bit about. I think they did, you did just Robert, a beautiful job of juxtaposing how, how far we've come in some ways and how close we are to um, just how close sadly we are to Jim Crow and slavery and all of the other things that we saw um, in this film. DA Rollins, thank you so much. Uh, I, I just want to add because she didn't take credit for it, um, but her uh, DA Rollins position in her election and then through her as her uh, throughout her tenure as a DA has influenced so much of the conversation around progressive prosecution and newly elected prosecutorial offices around the country. I'll just give one example that I know from personal experience. Uh, recently, as many of you know, uh, District Attorney George Gascon was elected to the, um, uh, to the office of DA for the County of Los Angeles, which is the largest district attorney office in the country, extraordinarily um, influential office. And I worked with their transition team to draft their misdemeanor declination and diversion policies. DA Gascon said just this that gave us the same mandate as DA Rollins. He said that, that we are focused on public safety, not social control, that we have limited resources. Those resources should be deployed um, uh, in an evidence-based and data-driven way, not based on old habits. Uh, we, everyone looked at the model that DA Rollins had created years before. So I just, so yes, it often, it is both true that things have not changed and have not changed enough. And it is also true that things are changing. Um, and, uh, and it is changing because individuals who are being elected or who are making films or uh, who are, are um, doing research are helping us, um, helping us change that conversation. And it's a perfect segue to turn to Udi Ofer uh, because of course the ACLU has been central to reform efforts and changing the conversation and changing our, understand, uh, our understanding of these issues for so long. I just wanna ask you to share with us and the audience the work that you have been doing. And also if, uh, for, the, for the folks who are interested in, in getting involved or doing something themselves, if you have any guidance. Sure, thank you so much. Um, thank you for hosting this event, for raising awareness on this issue. So I wanted to add an additional perspective um, and you know, share a bit about how the ACLU thinks about this issue and some of the work we're currently engaged in on this issue. So at the ACLU, we have campaigns to end mass incarceration and the war on drugs, right? Dramatically reduce the size and budget of police, elect prosecutors who are committed to ending mass incarceration, challenge fines and fees, employment bail reform, and so much more. And the reason I mention that is that this issue, right, of misdemeanor arrests is a part of all of these campaigns and all of these issues. It really cross, crosses so many of the different priorities that the ACLU has. But I also wanted to um, add an additional perspective that wasn't covered in the film, and it's not a criticism. I think this film is amazing and I'm a huge fan. But I don't think we can talk about misdemeanors without also talking about broken windows policing and the related policing strategies that have been implemented in the past four decades that have deliberately, deliberately and proactively led um, to an increase in the number of misdemeanor arrests in the United States, right? It's absolutely true that misdemeanor arrests um, have been a part of our nation's history since its founding. In fact, since colonial days, right? Um, you know, we had slave patrols existed in, in, for 150 years in, co in colonial America and after the founding of our nation, right? Post reconstruction, the black codes that led to tens of thousands of black people being arbitrarily arrested, followed by the Jim Crow era. So there's no question that we have a long history in the US of enforcement of discretionary low-level offenses in the forms of misdemeanors uh, used to subjugate the Black community um, and to enforce white supremacy and cultural norms. 
But the present moment that we're in also comes from a very specific additional backlash and we have to name it in order to fight it. And that is the introduction of broken windows policing theory um, and so-called zero tolerance policing or order maintenance policing that, that has been the driving theory of policing in this country since the 1980s really. Um, right, the current period that we're in when it comes to policing practices, when it comes to mass incarceration, came as a direct backlash to the civil rights movement of the 50s and 60s, right, which led to new rights, not only in the voting rights space and, you know, when it came to ending legal segregation, but also in the criminal justice space, right, we had a Supreme Court that was, you know, making it harder for the police to arbitrarily search and arrest people. Um, you have the Supreme Court saying that evidence that's seized illegally um, can't be used against you. It was a really big deal in the 50s and 60s. And then the backlash began, right? The backlash that began in the late 70s through the 90s and really peaking in the, in, in the late 90s through the early 2000s. And at the core of this backlash is a law and order mentality that has been pushed by Democrats, including the current sitting president of the United States and Republicans that push right for mandatory minimums, three strike laws, more death penalty, but also for a new kind of policing. And, you know, and specifically broken windows policing that believe that the, the police should spend their time focusing heavily on so-called low level offenses, right? On misdemeanors, on things like littering, panhandling, petty larceny, sex work, trespass, public intoxication, urinating in public, vandalism, drugs for personal use, school truancy, and the list goes on and on. And to not do this in all neighborhoods, this is not the type of policing we see in white affluent communities, but to do it in low income black and brown neighborhoods. And it was a deliberate theory of policing. There's, there's, there's many books written. This is what police are trained in the academy that tells them to focus on misdemeanors, to focus on low level offenses, to stop people, to frisk people, to search people, to arrest people for misdemeanors. It's what they call proactive policing, right? Where they genuinely believe that they're catching quote unquote future criminals who are gonna do bigger and badder things if they're not stopped now. It is 100% racial profiling. It is 100% racist. It has targeted black and brown communities across the country. And it is this, we are now living the product of that, right? It is the reason that police officers spend the majority of their time on misdemeanor arrests, that prosecutor offices, 80% of their dockets are misdemeanors. It's the reason we spend $119 billion a year on policing, that we have more than 700,000 police officers. Um, um, according to the FBI, the uh, police officers make more than 10 million arrests a year. That's 28,000 arrests a day. Every three seconds in America, someone is arrested. And even by the FBI's own data, so this isn't is an ACLU spin data, but by the FBI's own data, the vast, vast, vast majority, in fact, almost all of these arrests have nothing to do with violence and they're not for serious offenses, right? 95% of all arrests in America have nothing to do with violence according to FBI's own statistics, right? Number one arrest in America by, by far is drug possession, right? 1.3 million arrests a year for drug possession. 1.2 million arrests a year for things like disorderly conduct, loitering, being drunk in public. How many arrests for violence? About 500,000 or 5% 5 of all arrests are for things like murder, manslaughter, rape, robbery, aggravated assault. So 500,000 arrests for, for violent offenses, 1.4 million for drug possession, 1.2 million for uh, disorderly conduct and loitering and so forth. That is a product of a policing theory and it's called broken windows policing. The good news is, and I'll wrap up, is that there's a movement that we're heavily involved in to change all of this. Um, a movement to decriminalize misdemeanors and to do it in a way that doesn't just lead to fines and fees, so to do it the right way. It's being done through legislative efforts, through ballot initiatives, by working with district attorneys like Rachel Rollins, who is absolutely a leader on this in the nation. 
I became the number one fan of District Attorney Rollins when we hosted the debate in the Suffolk County Jail, which, by the way, I still think is the only debate ever in American history of a DA debate hosted in a county jail. Um, um, but she, 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 she ignited a spark where now you have, you know, you know, you have Larry Krasner in Philadelphia, John Cruzo in Dallas, Chesa Bodine in San Francisco, um, passing similar policies. But we also have legislative efforts. You know, this past election day, the state of Oregon, or the people of Oregon, voted for a ballot initiative that decriminalized all drug possession. Drug possession in Oregon had been a misdemeanor. Thousands of people were getting arrested for drug possession in Oregon. I'm not talking about marijuana, I'm talking about old drugs. The voters of Oregon voted to decriminalize the, that, that misdemeanor. We are seeing these efforts all over the country beginning to pop up. Um, last year, Michigan decriminalized many traffic misdemeanors. Um, this year, we have an effort in Nevada to do something similar. On the federal level, we're seeing real movement on marijuana decriminalization and to do it in a justice-oriented way. Senator Schumer um, um, he said he supports it. Uh, uh, Senator Booker is leading that effort. So, so I'm, I'm hopeful, and there are campaigns going on all over the country. It's also part of the police defund message. While you know, people may disagree on, on the language of police defund, but at, at its core, police defund is really about stripping away from the police the authority to make these types of offense uh, of arrests and many more and all arrests really many more and reinvesting that 119 billion dollars a year in proactive community safety models. Um, I'll just end by saying this is the 50 year anniversary of the launch of the war on drugs which is very much tied into this issue and we at the ACLU are going to be pushing President Biden and have been to really make a bold statement that's saying we are ready for a new era in America. We are ready to end the war on drugs. We are ready to end broken windows policing and to move forward. And it's very much in line with this film and this work. Ludi, thank you so much. I want to just double down for uh, um, just for one moment on something that you said to bring it into the, the context that we're grappling with today. Um, which is that you remind us that broken windows, policing, stop and frisk are part of a larger phenomenon of misdemeanors that we cannot understand the whole without understanding the parts. And it was one of my hopes um, by writing a book, asserting that there was a thing called the misdemeanor system, which is, of course is a fiction, there is no system. It is thousands and thousands of offices and decision makers all over the country, but to assert the fiction the very productive and useful fiction that we have a misdemeanor system that produces 80% of the criminal dockets in this country and that it is made up of all these pieces about which we have been concerned and battling for decades. Stop and frisk, broken windows, bail, the debtor's prisons, um, decriminalization, the war on drugs, that we can understand so many of these moving pieces as part of this larger phenomenon. And so thank you for reminding us that the whole is related to the parts and that we can't understand the full impact of the parts without seeing it in the context of the whole. I wanna turn now to Dr. Smith, um, your sociologist <laughs> um, uh, and an educator. I wanna of course give you a chance to tell us what you thought about the film, but also to ask you how you see this moving, uh, the, this, the, this conversation moving the scholarly debate and the relationship between the sociological conversation, what I think Robert called the, the human conversation and the legal and, and more formal criminal conversation? Um, great questions. Let me first start by saying, I mean, it's hard to say that you really enjoy a film like this. It's, it, I, it's extraordinarily well done. Um, I left feeling the kind of rage that um, D.A. Rollins talked about. Um, and um, I also left feeling like I'm sick of feeling rage um, because of increasing knowledge about the role <clears throat> that uh, the penal system plays, um, especially in communities of color. Um, so in terms of what I'm thinking about with regards, so we, we were asked to think about uh, uh, where this film and the book that um, inspired us, left us feeling, what, what were we thinking? Um, 
one of the things that I thought was really uh, so incredibly well done about the film was the juxtaposition of the past and the present. While talking about the more recent uh, misdemeanors, um, you also told stories about um, uh, Black folks who've experienced very similar kinds of harms 100 years ago, whatever it might be, which does link the past, um, this history of oppression, exploitation, et cetera, to the future. Um, they're different. There are different offenses that people are getting caught under, but the, but the offenses are doing the same thing. Misdemeanor injustice is about exploitation, extraction, and oppression. It's about containment and confinement, control. Um, and I think what you want to do about it is in part a function of, of your theory about what this system is about. Um, to me, misdemeanor justice um, or injustice is a part of, and parcel of a broader system of racial and class domination. Um, we have seen um, in the past, we've moved from one institution of domination to the next. Um, we've moved from slavery to Jim Crow, Jim Crow to segregation, segregation to mass incarceration, mass criminaliz criminalization. Um, I think it is important to talk about the kinds of efforts we can make right now to hopefully bring about changes in communities so that people day to day can feel less oppressed, less exploited. But I think it would be a mistake to imagine that the kinds of reforms that we're thinking about won't be replaced by other forms or modes of domination. I, I just think it would be kind of foolish to, to, to proceed in that way. And so we, I think we even we have to think even bigger. Um, a lot of people are offended by this idea of defunding police. Um, and, and perhaps it is the case that the term itself is, is so politically loaded as to be um, unproductive right now. But I, I do think that it makes sense to think about for communities that have been impacted by the penal system in this way for generations upon generations, identify a generation where this has not been the case, um, that we should think about the removal as a, as a perhaps a first step in dismantling um, this system, um, uh, this racial, uh, this institution of racial domination, removing police from um, these communities. I, I think it is not an unreasonable thing to consider. Um, and I think it for three reasons, and I'm hoping that people will stay with me as I uh, put this forward. Um, and I think I'm a reasonable person, so I'm hoping that others will try to see, try to, try to see the reason with me. First, I think we should consider, because I'm sure everybody's wondering how, what do you do with crime and how do you deal with crime, et cetera, if you were to remove police. Let's first consider that very little of the time that police officers spend it at work involves actual crime fighting. And this is the case, even in the most dangerous neighborhoods or communities. In Baltimore in 1999, the most violent and most addicted and most abandoned city in America, um, regular patrol officers spent 11% of their time on crime in places where where crime rates are much lower they're spending less than one percent of their time on crime um and so we see evidence that much of what the police is doing so this is not to say they're not doing anything much of the, the work that they're doing is devoted to non-criminal kinds of activities activities that could easily be farmed out by other public servants probably cheaper probably more efficient, uh, more efficiently and significantly reducing the likelihood of the kind of violence that we see on a, on a too regular basis. Um, so, so first, uh, what exactly might we be losing um, considering the fact that police are not spending most of their time doing crime fighting? Second, in high, high crime communities, um, which are disproportionately low income, communities of color, uh, police do more harm than good. We just, we're seeing uh, an explosion of research that um, indicates the social costs of the kind of policing that um, Udi has just referred to. Um, the over-policing of some communities, engaging in proactive policing policies, frequent stopping of pedestrians, unnecessary and often unconstitutional searching of people, using unnecessary force sometimes, which sometimes leads to real bodily harm, death, et cetera. Um, is combined with an under-policing where the people of the same communities don't get assisted when they are in need. Um, and so one wonders then in those situations, what are we actually, uh, how, how are folks in these communities actually benefiting by the presence of police? Mostly what you can see is a whole heap of harm. Um, although some aggressive policing practices, I should say, have been found to bring down rates of crime, including violent crime in the short term, 
police violence itself has been found to have short and long-term negative consequences, consequences for the social, economic, and, uh, and, and health outcomes for people in those communities. I have uh, colleagues here at the, the Kennedy School who've done amazing research highlighting how if a police kills someone in your community for young, for adolescents, um, even those who are completely disconnected from that person who was murdered, all of a sudden it has this dramatic impact on their educational attainment and occupational achievement. They're less likely to go to school. Absentee rates um, skyrocket. Um, their uh, GPA declines and over multiple semesters. They're less likely to graduate high school, less likely to go on to college. We also see these negative effects on the adults in those same communities. This has a ripple effect that we should be paying serious attention to. The costs are high and we're not paying anywhere near as much attention to that as I think we should. And so we should really be paying attention to these issues um, with regards to these costs um, and the benefits. And then there's this interesting thing where the police don't actually do a good job of solving crimes in these communities. Um, the vast majority of unsolved murders are of black people, paradoxically often in the very communities that are being over-policed. Um, why are we not all more <laughs> um, outraged by this? And here's the third point. And I think that this in some ways will probably not enough um, um, address the concerns that some have about what you do if you don't have police. There are options and more and more models are emerging every day that are better, more, that they're better, more effective and more efficient approaches to keeping communities safe rather than policing. Um, so for instance, uh, there's a cahoots model that 20 to 50% of fatal encounters with law enforcement involve individuals with mental illnesses. Cahoots mod methods show that this does not have to be the case in Eugene, Oregon, uh, out of a total of 24,000 cahoots calls, police backup was requested for only 250. 25,000 calls and police were only needed in 250. So they achieve public safety at a lower cost uh, more effectively addressing the crises, including conflict resolution, welfare checks, substance abuse, suicide threats, et cetera. Um, this is not, a, this is not some, a model that should remain in Eugene. And in fact, other places are starting to think about this as a, as a, a good model to address at, at the very least mental health issues. But what CAHOOTS shows is that it can go beyond that. Cure Violence um, um, is a, a set of po uh, programs, uh, although they don't like to call it programs, or strategies that effectively increase pro-social bonds and social supports so that people rely on violence yes to, less to resolve um, issues or problems. Environmental strategies. We can green vacant lots and apparently that <laughs> helps to reduce crime and violence significantly. Prioritize young people. We should be investing in the people who are in these communities, young people, so that they have a sense that they have a future. Um, reduce financial hardships. One of the best things to come out of this COVID um, um, bill is that it is providing income supplements, which itself reduces stress and also a whole host of negative outcomes that are associated with it. Um, if we were to take on a lot of these strategies, and you have to try things out, um, there's just no question about it. We don't have any clear replacements at this point. We can probably, in these communities that suffer constantly um, by the presence of police, where the, there's far more harm being done than good, um, it makes sense to start to consider other options for achieving safety. And we, we have a, 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 an abundance of research that shows directions that we can go. So I would su suggest as the Yale um, uh, law professor Monica Bell herself argues, we should denaturalize the police. We don't need necessarily need, police have not always existed. We don't need them necessarily to achieve goals of, of, of public safety. And to the ex extent that police have been a key agent of, of domination in these institutions, in these communities of racial and class domination, I think it's 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 time that we consider um, other alternatives. I'm sick and tired of, of knowing that even some of my own relatives continue to live in communities where this, these are issues. And so you get round up, not just by misdemeanor um, uh, offenses, but by a whole host of others. It's time for us to consider a change. So I'll end my comments there. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Smith. I saw, before we go on, though, I, saw, I think I saw D.A. Rollins. You had a hand or a flag. Can I can I let you get in a word edgewise here? Uh, yeah, I mean, I just am so happy that this fabulous doctor is right at Harvard and we get to talk about things together. I hope moving forward because, um, you know, 
she has hit the nail directly on the head in the sense of, you know, we're thinking about Robert telling a story. All of these misdemeanors are happening in the very communities where the murders are happening. And people don't have the time to, to distinguish between, are you a transit police officer? Are you a Boston police officer? Are you a state police officer? Are you an ICE agent? Are, they just look at you and know you're the police. They don't know whether you're in the homicide unit or you're in B2 as a, you know, walking, you know, walking beat officer. And if you are ringing my doorbell and badgering me and my family about a trespass and we have an unsolved homicide in the same house, or if you treat my mother or father, um, which, you know, this has happened disrespectfully because you assume their son, you know, who is alleged to have done X, Y, or Z, um, they're at fault for that behavior. Well, you don't know that one of their daughters is the district attorney of Suffolk County. The other one is the executive director of the Red Sox Foundation. Yes, you might be there about one of their other siblings, but they are super voters. They are potential grand jurors and they are potential trial jurors. So when they have a negative interaction with law enforcement, that taints everything, right? So we have to be able to talk about that. And that's the sort of hypocrisy. And this is the one last point I'll make. When we talk about drug possession, which people have said, we can't let this, this conversation go by without recognizing when it was crack cocaine and heroin, and it was the 80s and 90s, and the people looked like Chris, Sandra, and Rachel. Nobody cared about the public health crisis that it always has been, right? They said, you have a problem, this is your problem, and they flung us in jail, right? Some of those drugs were heroin, uh, some of those drugs were crack cocaine, some of those drugs were marijuana. And now in Massachusetts, medicinal and recreational marijuana are legal. It is a billion with a B dollar industry. And we are seeing percentages that are astronomical with respect to others making money off of the very thing that we have, um, that has been such a, 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 a part of the harm that has impacted certain communities. So we have to point out that hypocrisy, uh, but we also have to do what Dr. Smith is doing with a with a methodical cost benefit analysis to say, this isn't just a pie in the sky, angry black woman, Rachel yelling something, right? This is a Harvard Business School professor saying, look at the data, tell us that we're wrong, right? And when we look at people in distress, guys, there is some heart-wrenching statistics about 50%, right? Maybe upwards of 50% of law uh, officer-involved shootings are somebody or, or harm are somebody that's in the midst of a mental health crisis, right? We have to get better training. We have to de-escalate and we have to think outside the box. That's what I want to say. Thanks. So unfortunately we are running out of time. I know we had a, a, a question, um, at least a couple of questions in the Q&A queue, but unfortunately we um, are, 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 are limited by the clock. I want to encourage the folks who had questions to reach out by email or um, to, to, to otherwise uh, contact our panelists. Uh, before I turn this over to Robert for his, his, um, uh, his last closing thoughts, I just want to remind everyone, as Robert mentioned, that, that educators, faith organizations, advocates uh, can um, access a, a free screening of racially charged, indeed all the Brave New Film um, uh, documentaries. It is a nonprofit organization. You can go to the website, misdemeanorfilm.org to sign up. I, should all, I also wanna thank my publisher at this moment, um, Basic Books, which has committed to providing a free exam copy of Punishment Without Crime to any group that wants to screen the film. So my, my gratitude towards to the publisher for making that available um, uh, available to the groups. Robert, uh, first of all, let, let me just say thank you to everyone for your time, to everybody who watched. We're, uh, we're profoundly grateful here for all the work that has gone into this conversation in this film. Robert, uh, I'll turn to you for our last words. <clears throat> thank you again. <clears throat> for the press who have questions that we weren't able to answer, as uh, Alexandra says, uh, just contact any of us directly or contact Josh or Sarah. We'll get your questions answered. So we don't have um, Netflix. We don't have Paramount, but we have each and every one of you. 
the full film, a one minute clip, a two minute clip, a three minute clip, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, you name it. And there is some part of this film, is it available on every single one of those platforms through the great work of Josh and Jill and Brave New Films team. So we need your help. You can arrange a screening. You can communicate to people using all of those platforms, schools, faith communities, uh, libraries, when things open up again, homes, sending it to media, elected officials, advocacy organizations. It really does take a village, a city, a town, a country. Millions of people have created this system. Millions of people have profited from this system. And it's going to take millions of us to say no, no more, fight back, use the clips. Thank you. Thanks each and every one of you. And let's use, as uh, DA said, our sorrow and our rage together. Thank you.